So with that, I will introduce myself. My name is Lindsay Reese, and I am the Education Coordinator for the Atlantic Marine Conservation Society. And we're very excited to present the Sea Turtles of New York program to you this evening. So I always like to take a minute um, at the beginning of all of our programs to thank our partners and sponsors, because truly without their help and support, we would not be able to fulfill our mission of promoting marine conservation through action. I do have some learning objectives for us this evening. First, I'll give you a brief introduction to the Atlantic Marine Conservation Society or AMCs as we often refer to ourselves because that is quite a long name to repeat. We'll go over the species of sea turtles found in the world, and then we'll focus on the ones that we specifically see here in New York waters. The threats that they're facing. And then of, co of course, and most importantly, how you can help. So first, what is AMCs? AMCs is an organization that was essentially founded by a group of volunteers in 2016 who were looking to make a difference in the environment. As an organization, we began responding to stranded marine mammals and sea turtles in 2017. So you might be wondering, what is a stranding? We define a stranding as any injured, sick, or deceased marine mammal or sea turtle that's found floating at the surface or washes up on our shores. And these animals can strand for a variety of reasons. They could be struggling with an illness, Perhaps they have an injury of some sort. Maybe they've ingested marine debris or they become entangled or they're already deceased. If the animals are deceased, we will perform a necropsy, which is essentially an autopsy, but on an animal. And through these necropsies or mortality investigations, as we often call them, we're really trying to get an inside look at how these animals live their life and then ultimately what caused their life to end. Besides responding to necropsies um, or strandings and performing necropsies, we also conduct uh, wild population assessments on the seal populations in our New York waters. So when we do that, we'll actually go out, capture seals. We collect the same information from them that your doctor wants from you at your annual checkup. We get their weight, their total length. We'll take biological samples from their eyes, nose, mouth, We'll collect blood samples. And from these samples, we're able to tell the animal's health. And that also gives us an idea of how the population is doing. Is there a contagious disease that could be making its way through the population of seals? And that's information that we need to know. We'll also attach a flipper tag to the seal and a satellite tag. The satellite tags allow us to see how these animals are moving through the marine environment are these seals hauling out anywhere that maybe we didn't realize they were using those areas? And it just gives us a better idea of how they're utilizing the marine environment. So besides responding to strandings, performing necropsies, doing population assessments, we also conduct education and outreach programs like the one we are doing here with you all this evening. And for me, this is one of the best parts of the job because I get to connect with members of the public and share with you and hopefully inspire you to promote marine conservation through action. So we are a small organization. We only have about eight staff members. So we really utilize our network of volunteers. Up here in this photo right here, two of our biologists are in the blue shirts and two of our volunteers are in the white t-shirts. Once our volunteers are trained, they're actually able to help us respond to strandings, help us with necropsies. So here in this photo, they're helping our biologists with a very large loggerhead sea turtle necropsy. And our volunteers are all over Long Island, which is very helpful for us because we're located in West Hampton Beach. So if an animal strands over on Jones Beach or maybe even in Staten Island, it can take us a while to get there. So if a volunteer can go out, be the first responder on the scene and start giving us an idea of the animal's condition, maybe providing photos and videos that maybe we weren't able to get with the stranding report, kind of clues the biologists in as to what they should expect when they get on scene. 
We also have an internship program for high school, college, and graduate level students. Carly here with me this evening, who's moderating the chat, was one of our summer college interns. So if you guys have any questions for her, she'd be happy to answer them. But our interns can help us with a wide variety of projects. They can help us out in the field with strandings and necropsies. They can help us at the office analyzing data. Maybe they're more interested in the business side of the organization and they can help us um, with our social media and marketing strategies. We have interns who are really interested in education and outreach. So they come with me to education programs, beach cleanups and other outreach events as well. Then over here, you can see our lead necropsy coordinator, Kim, working with the local Marine Patrol to respond to this deceased minke whale. So most of the animals that we respond to are federally protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act or the Endangered Species Act. So we work very closely with our local, state, and federal agencies when we're responding to these animals. Our relationships with them are also quite helpful because these animals don't always strand in the most easy to access areas. So if we can't get there easily by vehicle or by walking, they can typically help us out and access the animal. So we really appreciate our partnerships with them. And then down here, last but certainly not least, the members of the public. So having you guys here at this education program tonight or people who join us at a beach cleanup or maybe an other outreach event, you guys are really taking the first step to taking ownership of the marine environment that we have right in our backyard. And for us, that's very exciting because we are looking to lead the next generation of stewards of the marine environment. So my first question for you all this evening, and you're welcome to put your answer in the chat. How many species of sea turtles are found in the world? How many do you think are found in the world? And if you put your answer in the chat, Carly will read it out. So any guess is a good guess. What do you guys think? Do you think there's five species, maybe six? Maybe double digits. Carly, do you have a guess? Oh, we do have one guess. We have a guess of six, I believe. Oh, that's a good guess. Very close. <laughs> Can we get one more guess? All right, well, we'll go with six. You're very close. The answer is seven. So there's actually seven species of sea turtles found in the world, and we have four of them in our New York waters. So here's an overview of the seven different species that are found in the world. And we're going to briefly go through the three that are not found here, and then we'll dive deeper into the four that we do see. So the first one is the flatback also called the Australian flatback, and you can probably guess how it got its name. It's named for its very flat shell on its back, and it's found in the waters surrounding Australia. So typically they're found um, in the water around Australia, but also Papua New Guinea uh, in the Pacific Ocean. And the flatback sea turtles, the adults can weigh up to almost 200 pounds and measure a little over three feet in the length of their shell. So they're not too big in comparison to some sea turtles that we see, but their diet is made up of a variety of organisms. They feed on sea cucumbers, jellyfish, mollusks, prawns, and even seaweed. Then we have the olive ridley sea turtle. So it got its name from the olive green color of its somewhat heart-shaped shell. These guys are one of the smaller species of sea turtles found in the world. And they're usually found in more tropical regions of the Pacific, Indian, and Atlantic oceans. So we're not gonna see them up here in New York, but they are found throughout the world. 
And unfortunately, the number of olive ridley sea turtles were greatly reduced um, from historic estimates due to overexploitation for turtle meat and eggs. And the olive ridley is an omnivore, meaning that it feeds on a wide variety of food items, including algae, lobsters, crabs, and other mollusks. And they can even dive to depths of about 500 feet to forage on organisms that might be living on the bottom of the seafloor. Then we have our hawksbill sea turtle. So they are named for their narrow pointed jaws or beak, and it resembles that of a hawk. So again, another very clever name for a sea turtle species, but they have a very distinctive pattern on their back um, with their overlapping scoots um, or scales along their shell. And their shell kind of has somewhat of a serrated looking edge and the color and pattern of their shell made them very valuable and commonly sold as tortoise shells in markets um, across the world. And they're typically found in the world's tropical oceans, um, predominantly around coral reefs. So the Hawksville sea turtle is extremely important to the coral reef ecosystem. They play a key role in keeping it healthy because they use their narrow pointed beaks to reach into the crevices of the reef and pull out um, sea sponges, uh, sea anemones, and jellyfish. So now we're going to begin talking about the four species of sea turtles that we find here in New York waters. So the first one is the Atlantic green sea turtle. It's the largest of the hard shell sea turtles that are found in our waters. Does anybody wanna take a guess as to how they got their name? And it's not because of a green shell, because as you, as you can see from this photo, their shell really is not that green looking. So what do you think is green? Oh, we have a comment that says algae. Very good. So the green sea turtle is a strict herbivore. They are only going to eat plant, mater plant materials like algae, seaweed, um, other seagrass. Uh, and so if we think back to maybe middle school biology, the chlorophyll pigment that is found in plants, whether aquatic or terrestrial, is what gives them that green coloring. So when the green sea turtle is eating all of this green plant material, that chlorophyll pigment is building up in the fat found underneath their shell and their muscle. And so we can actually see somewhat of a greenish color uh, when we are performing the necropsies on these green sea turtles. So that is how their name uh, came about but they are listed as threatened under the Endangered Species Act. So they're not an endangered species, um, but their numbers are just kind of sitting right above that line. Um, so we definitely don't want their numbers to decline anymore. So organizations around the world are working to protect this species. Now getting into our loggerhead sea turtles. Does anybody wanna take a guess as to how they got their name? By looking at this picture, you might get a clue. <laughs> well, they're the second largest of the hard shelled sea turtles that we have in our waters. And they got their name because they have a very large head and very strong jaws. So with their strong jaws, they're able to crush shelled organisms such as crabs, whelks, conchs, um, lobsters. And so when they crush those shells, they're able to get to the animal that lives inside of it and prey on them. They're one of the most abundant species of sea turtles that nest in the United States. Uh, we don't have any nests up here in New York, which we'll touch on a little bit later, but these guys nest quite a lot down in the southeastern region of the United States. As with our Atlantic green sea turtle, the loggerhead is listed as threatened as well. So not an endangered species, um, but we don't want their numbers to decline at all. 
Then we move on to the Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. So this is the smallest species of sea turtle that we find in our waters. And this sea turtle is actually named after a fisherman, Richard Kemp, who was in Key West, Florida. And he first submitted the species for identification in 1906. So I'm still hoping that I've got many more years to try to discover a new species and maybe it can be named after me because 1906 wasn't too long ago. These guys are listed as endangered though. So we were quite hard to protect this species. And they're actually one of the species that we find washing up on our shores during the late fall, early winter, during cold stunning season, as we refer to it for our sea turtles. So a lot of organizations uh, within New York and the New England area work to rescue and rehabilitate the Kemp's Ridley sea turtles who wash up cold stun to get them back out into the environment, living a healthy life. And the Kemp's Ridley, along with the Olive Ridley sea turtle, they do something really interesting when they nest. So they'll actually engage in something that's called an arribada, which is basically they all get together out in the ocean just off of a nesting beach. And they're kind of coming together all in a group, all females. And then they come up to the beach at the exact same time to nest. Can you guys think, why would these sea turtles all nest at the exact same time? What's the purpose of doing that? Anybody want to take a guess? Feel free to put it in the chat. Carly, do you want to take a guess? Does it have to do with safety and numbers? Yes. So mm -hmm. safety and numbers. So the females all come up together in hopes that they won't be at a large risk for predation. And then also the eggs that they're laying. So they're kind of thinking that if they all lay their eggs at the same time, they'll be safe and um, their eggs won't be predated on by um, small species of uh, animals or humans as well. And the Kemp's Ridley's diet consists of mainly crabs, but they will scavenge on dead fish um, and other discarded bycatch. So easier to eat meals. Now we have the leatherback. So the leatherback is the largest sea turtle found in the world, and it has a soft shell. Obviously, it's named the leatherback. So its back does feel quite leathery, and it has these very uh, long longitudinal ridges that go down the entire carapace or shell of the sea turtle. And these guys are highly migratory. So some of them will swim over 10,000 miles a year between their nesting grounds and their foraging grounds. They also can dive quite deep. They have the deepest recording dive of almost 4,000 feet, which is deeper than most marine mammals go. And they dive this great depth because they exclusively feed on jellyfish, which can be found throughout the water column, either at the surface or quite deep in the water. And the leatherback has somewhat of a uh, pointed tooth-like cusp and sharp edge jaws so that they are able to capture that very soft uh, gelatinous prey item such as jellyfish and, and salps. So you guys might have noticed some salps in our waters recently. Um, so these guys feed on those as well. And the leatherback's uh, mouth and throat also have backward pointing spines that some people call papillae or papillae, and it helps them retain that gelatinous prey so that it can't come back up out of their mouth. And these guys are listed as an endangered species um, under the Endangered Species Act. So we work to protect them as well. So you might have heard me mention that they don't nest in New York. So why are sea turtles here? So 
Although they don't nest in New York, our waters are great places for turtles during the summertime. So they come here, they have great food resources, um, and they uh, use our waterways to just migrate through. They might come into the Long Island Sound, which is typically a little bit warmer than the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and so they'll enjoy that nice warm water until they leave to head back down south or to other areas, warmer areas uh, during our winter time. So although we know that sea turtles don't nest in New York, we did have one instance of a sea turtle nest in 2018. It was a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle and she laid her nest um, near the Rockaways area. In the middle of the day, she walked right up on the beach and started digging her nest and laid her eggs. It was quite the um, spectation, I think, for all the beach goers. And something that's really interesting, if you guys didn't know this, is that when sea turtles lay their eggs, they're laying their eggs on the same beach that they were born on. So sea turtles are born with what we would call an internal compass, uh, and they're able to find their way back to that same beach when they have reached sexual maturity and they're ready to mate and lay their eggs, uh, which is really interesting. But also we could run into a couple problems with down the road. Can you guys think of what might happen to the beaches that these turtles have been laying their nests on? Think of some things that are happening in our coastal communities. What could be impacting those beaches? Erosion. Oh, yes, that is a great example. So yes, erosion can definitely have an impact on our beaches. You know, that sand might not be there when those turtles go back to nest. We have another comment that says disappear due to sea level rise. Yes. So the sand might not be there or the beach is going to be underwater. So those are two great examples of how that could impact our sea turtles. Also think about coastal development. So it might not be erosion or sea level rise that takes away that beach, but a building could go up right there and kind of deter the turtles from laying their nest there. So all of these things could definitely have an impact on um, the reliability of these beaches for turtles to lay their eggs. So most sea turtles in the United States lay their nests um, in the Georgia, South Carolina area and go all the way down to the Caribbean. Uh, within those areas, we see a lot of loggerheads. As I mentioned, that's one of the most popular species to find nesting on US beaches. Um, some leatherbacks will nest in Florida and throughout the Caribbean islands, you'll see green sea turtles, leatherbacks, and even Hawksville sea turtles. They don't make their way up all the way up to New York. So once sea turtles hatch out of their, what we would call a clutch, um, they uh, will make their way to the beach. But does anybody know how sea turtles are given their sex? So how are they given male or female? Does anybody know? All right, this might be new information for you guys. So when sea turtle, female oh, sea turtle- We do have, sorry, Lindsay, we do have one uh, comment that says temperature of nest. Very good, yes. So when the female sea turtles go up on the beach and dig the hole, they lay their eggs and they can lay upwards of about a hundred eggs in each, uh, what we would call a clutch or each nest. And about 60 days later, the eggs hatch. And within that nest, the cooler sand is going to be on the bottom. And obviously it's going to be warmer at the top of the nest. So scientists have found that the cooler sand at the bottom it's formulating male sea turtles and the eggs that are closer to the top of the nest that are closer to the sun, a little bit warmer, they're typically producing female sea turtles. 
So if you kind of think back to that topic, a lot of people are talking about climate change, warming temperatures, the sand getting warmer. Scientists are finding that a lot of the sea turtles that are hatching from these nests are mainly females. How do you guys think that's going to impact the population of sea turtles if most of the hatchlings are females? Their population numbers will decrease. Yeah, definitely. So when they go to mate near the beaches where they're going to be laying their eggs, there's not going to be that many males for them to mate with. So population numbers could certainly decrease in that way. And also there could be something called a genetic bottleneck where all these females are mating with the same males. And so we're going to have some genetic issues with the hatchlings because a lot of them are going to have half of the same genetic material. So definitely something that Scientists are kind of thinking about and trying to work towards solutions um, to be able to somewhat combat that problem because it's especially concerning for our endangered sea turtle spe species like the Kemp's Ridley. So sea turtles make their way, they hatch from their nest, they make their way out to sea if they don't get distracted. So when these hatchlings come up out of the nest, they have a lot of challenges and kind of hoops to jump through before they get to the water. Obviously, there's the threat of predation. So other animals um, coming to snack on them, such as shorebirds or maybe um, smaller marine mammals like wild dogs, fox, but also they can get kind of distracted. So they use the light of the moon to guide them towards the water. But if there are any house lights on near the beach or street lights, or maybe hotel lights, it can be quite confusing for the sea turtles and they can kind of get uh, distracted and kind of wandering around the beach. So a lot of places in these areas where sea turtles are hatching in large numbers, actually enforce uh, changing street lights and house lights to a reddish or amber color during the summertime, during sea turtle nesting season, to try to avoid confusing the hatchlings. Um, so they definitely have a lot of threats, um, and unfortunately a high percentage of them don't necessarily make it to full adulthood from the hatchling stage, um, but those that do are very, very important to the population. So once they are in the water, um, they are kind of just swimming everywhere, really. Uh, it's what we would call a frenzy. Um, so they're out there and these hatchlings are kind of just along the surface of the water for the first year or so of their life. They're living in what we would call like seaweed or the rack line of the uh, surface of the water. And there they're eating on little organisms, just trying to blend into their environment, just trying to survive. Um, and once they're out there, we actually call it their lost years because we're not able to attach satellite tags or any kind of tracking monitor to these very small sea turtle hatchlings. So we don't necessarily know exactly where they go or what they do. Um, during this time, we just know that they'll spend about four to five years just hanging out in and floating in the ocean's current. So what do they eat? So this will be um, a good time for us to review what I shared with you earlier when we went through each different species. So up here we have some um, seaweed. So what species of sea turtle do you guys think is gonna be eating the seaweed? Any guesses yet? I have a guess. What about, oh, okay. We have a comment as well. <laughs> the green. Green Very sea good. Yes, the green sea turtle is going to be the species that it's going to eat that plant material. Very good. All right, here we have spider crabs. Who do we think is going to be eating a spider crab? Maybe a turtle with 
really strong jaws. How about the hawk's bill? It certainly could be a food item of the hawk's bill. What about the Kemp's Ridley too? And the loggerhead. So those species of sea turtles that are gonna be feeding predominantly on shelled organisms um, like our crabs. And remember our loggerheads have those really strong jaws so they're able to crush into that animal. Down here, we've got some bivalves. We've got a little crab over here. So who do you think is gonna be eating these shelled organisms? It can be more than one kind of turtle. So with these shelled organisms, the Kemp's Ridley is gonna be feeding on those guys, loggerheads as well. The green sea turtle will not be eating them because remember they only eat plant species. And then our leatherback that we find is going to only be feeding on jellyfish. Um, so remember these guys can dive quite deep to gather their food items and they have those cool spines in their mouth and in their throat to keep down their gelatinous prey items. Good job. So you might be wondering, how do these animals get to Long Island? So they come up here because um, here is in the Long Island Sound and within the Atlantic Ocean is great food items for them. We've also got some shallow areas in the bays and the coves that they can hide in. And ultimately the Long Island Sound is a great place for our younger sea turtles because it's a estuary. So it's a mix of freshwater and salt water, lots of different food items for them. And it's also protected from that rough, large Atlantic Ocean out there. Um, so we do see um, somewhat of a wide range um, of ages for the sea turtles that we find stranding along our beaches, but they are here, especially during the summertime. So I encourage you guys, if you're out there boating or on the water, make sure you're keeping an eye out for our sea turtle friends. Um, and we mostly find adults far offshore, so they'll have a larger carapace in size. Um, and we have been seeing those guys stranding mostly along our southern shores. And we'll get into that in just a little bit. So now we're gonna be talking about the threats that sea turtles are facing. And unfortunately, the list is quite long. So first we have environmental disasters. So you guys might think back and remember the 2010 Gulf of Mexico oil spill. So some of our staff members were actually a part of the team that responded down there um, to the Gulf of Mexico uh, to help the marine mammals and sea turtles that were being impacted by this devastating um, event. And uh, this here is an image of a Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. It was covered in oil, so it's getting a nice little bath um, using a soft toothbrush um, to get it cleaned up. But oil spills can be very challenging for sea turtles and other marine animals um, because simply they breathe air. So the sea turtles have to come to the surface to take a breath. And when they would come to the surface of the water with that oil right on top, the oil is getting into their eyes, their nose, their mouth, it's on their skin and their carapace. Um, so ultimately just making life not that comfortable for them. And it could have an extreme effect on just their quality of life and their health. Um, and unfortunately, we are seeing now studies that have been continuing for the last 10, 11 years after this oil spill and finding that it's having long term effects on these uh, populations. So it's affecting their immune systems, they're immunocompromised, and then it's also affecting the females uh, reproductive success. So we'll have to wait and see, um, you know, what those studies find and if that's going to have 
a significant impact on these populations and their numbers. So as an organization, AMCs came together and said that we wanted to be prepared if there was another environmental disaster such as the Gulf of Mexico oil spill. So this is our 26 foot mobile response trailer. We can trailer it really anywhere um, to provide a multi-level uh, response. So within this trailer, um, it is outfitted with water, electric, um, we can have heat, um, AC, and as it's 26 feet long, we have a lot of room to work around and this is just the counter area. So it's essentially a triage facility. So if we were to go somewhere where there were um, a large number of sea turtles stranded or even dolphins stranded, we would be able to use this trailer um, somewhat as an environment to triage these animals, clean them up, give them an assessment, and then hopefully uh, get them to a proper rehab facility in um, a quick amount of time. So this trailer, we're really trying to be prepared and um, take the next step towards protecting these species who might have what we would determine as a mass stranding, so a large number of them. Uh, and then we would be able to work together with our network partners to uh, mount a response. So besides environmental disasters, we have what we would call man-made disasters. So marine debris ingestion is something that we're seeing quite frequently with marine mammals, sea turtles, shorebirds, really any animal um, is not immune to this issue. So here in this photo is a very large uh, leatherback sea turtle that stranded actually a couple years ago, but we had a very similar animal strand just last week. Um, and unfortunately with these guys, remember that they're main prey item that they're feeding on is jellyfish. Who remembers or who can think of what marine debris item looks like a jellyfish? What do you guys think? One comment says balloons. Balloons. Yep. Those are a good one. They definitely look like jellyfish. What else? Plastic bags. Plastic bags. And that is unfortunately exactly what we found in this animal. So, oops, excuse me. So within that large leatherback sea turtle, we found plastic pieces, a 15 gallon clear trash bag, and this food wrapper right here. They were found in their esophagus and within the stomach. And unfortunately, these were determined to be the cause of death of this animal. And we found plastic in a leatherback stomach just last week as well. So these animals are not able to tell the difference between these man-made materials and their prey items. So they get confused. They consume them. Not only can it clog their esophagus or disrupt their intestines and their GI tract, but it can uh, confuse them and make them think that they ate food they were supposed to eat, and then they're not hungry for other food items. So they're not getting any of the proper nutrients that they need. And unfortunately, that can cause um, other health issues down the line if they were able to, um, you know, not, imme not immediately pass away from these items. So now moving into fishery interactions. So as you can see here, we've got a couple different fishing hooks. And then this is actually a stingray barb that was uh, pulled out of a sea turtle. So as you can see here in this photo, it is hooked right on the mouth. And then down here in this x-ray is a hook in the esophagus. Um, so our sea turtles will uh, get a little curious out there in the water, especially around fishing piers and fishing boats, because on the end of these hooks is bait. And so they're thinking that this is going to be an easy meal for them. And they're going after the bait items that are on the ends of the fishing hooks. And unfortunately that gets them into a little bit of trouble. 
And sea turtles need air to breathe, as I mentioned earlier when we were talking about the environmental disasters. So if they're hooked on something like a long line or um, maybe trapped in a net of some sort, uh, they're not going to be able to get to the surface to breathe. So that's obviously going to have a huge impact on them. Uh, but with these hooks, it could certainly damage their mouth. Once it's in their esophagus, it could damage their esophagus. It could affect their respiration rates. Um, and if they're able to survive with the hook in their mouth, it could affect their feeding habits, which could have a long-term effect on these animals. So long line fishing is usually used um, to catch sharks and tuna and swordfish. And the long lines, um, which have monofilament filament fishing line on them, um, have the hooks with the bait. And so, as I mentioned, the sea turtles get caught on these hooks. Um, and these hooks have um, different ways of working. So we have J hooks and circle hooks. So if you see here, we have the circle hook. So circle hooks are actually designed to hook the mouth and not be swallowed by the sea turtles. So in theory, they do less harm to the animal. Where with J hooks, um, we do find that those are being um, more easily ingested by sea turtles. So if we look back here, you guys can kind of see the differences uh, between these hooks and the hook down here in the esophagus. You also might notice here that this one looks quite clean and this one looks a little maybe on the dirtier side and it's actually cut down the middle. So some researchers and fishermen worked together to actually create fishing hooks that are available today that are made of a different material that helps them to corrode faster. So if an animal does get hooked um, on the line or maybe breaks it off and swallows the hook, it will break down a lot faster so that the animal isn't necessarily stuck with that hook for the rest of their lifetime. But then, you know, fishermen have to weigh the pros and cons of that because those hooks are actually more expensive, but you don't get to keep them for forever. So now moving into bycatch. So bycatch is one of the primary threats to sea turtles. Um, it's basically the unintended capture of an animal that you were not hoping to catch. Um, so a lot of sea turtles get caught in nets um, on fishing lines, like long line fishing, um, also in trawls and even buoy lines that are trapped to um, pots and traps. And so to combat this problem, which was actually plaguing many sea turtles in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, researchers worked together with scientists and fishermen to come up with something that we call the TED or the turtle excluder device. And how it works is um, the sea turtles, which are pretty big when they come in contact with the TED, um, which is uh, now a part of the shrimp trawl net. Um, and it's actually required in the Gulf of Mexico now um, for those commercial fishing uh, vessels. So when the turtle goes in to the trawl net, the force of them hitting the TED device right here uh, and the water pushes them up out of the net, as you can see in this opening, and um, kind of uses it as a ramp. And this is actually shown to reduce sea turtle bycatch by 70%. So that's quite a large percentage of sea turtles that are now being saved um, within the shrimp trawling industry. Um, and it, so it really just goes to show you how when researchers and scientists and fishermen work together, we really can create quite a supportive community that cares about the animals in the marine environment and is also looking to help the local economy. Because in the Gulf of Mexico, the shrimping industry is extremely important. So we didn't, they didn't wanna shut that down, but they needed to come up with a way that was going to protect these animals. Now getting into entanglements. So we've mentioned 
fishing, we've mentioned bycatch. So through either one of those, these sea turtles can become entangled. So that's when they um, are wrapped into a fishing net, as you can see here in this photo, or down here, they're wrapped in buoy lines. And so with that, um, they can become injured. So that entanglement can actually become uh, quite embedded in their flippers um, or even around their neck and head area. And the embedment of that gear can lead to an infection. It could lead to an amputation. And ultimately, if that gear is heavy enough on the sea turtle, it can cause the sea turtle to drown as well. Um, so if they're not becoming, um, have an infection or an amputation, or deceased, um, we actually work to disentangle live sea turtles in New York waters. So this is our lead necropsy coordinator, Kim, and she is the head of sea turtles um, for New York. And so when we get a call about an entangled sea turtle, she is leading the charge. And although she might make it look quite easy in this photo to disentangle this very large leatherback from this gill net, it's actually quite difficult. We don't just jump in there and start cutting away the net. Uh, we definitely have to get more of a clear idea of how the net or fishing line or rope, whatever the material is, how it's wrapped around the sea turtle. We look for any signs of an injury, infection? Is there a possibility for amputation? If we disentangle this sea turtle, does it need to go to a rehab facility or could we release it back out into the wild immediately? So with this particular case, she was able to cut the gill net off of the leatherback sea turtle and it was released um, right there, uh, but that's not always the case. And as you can see, it's splashing around quite a bit and she is leaning over the side of a vessel. So that's actually the safest way to disentangle these animals. We never wanna get in the water with these animals because as you can see, splashing around and leatherbacks can grow to be somewhere between 700 to over a thousand pounds. And their pectoral flippers can have a six foot uh, wingspan. So they certainly can pack a mean punch with their flippers um, and safety is always the top priority in any situation. So thankfully, this was a successful case and Kim was able to disentangle this animal and send it on its way. Um, it wasn't deemed necessary to go to a rehab facility. Now we're getting into vessel strikes. And sadly, this is something that we're seeing a lot of this summer, um, especially with our loggerhead sea turtles. And we're getting quite a few strandings within the New York bite area. So specifically looking at Staten Island and the Rockaways, uh, which really makes sense once um, we get a couple more slides in and I show you our strandings map. Um, but vessel strikes are, um, almost lethal to sea turtles. So underneath their carapace sits their two very large uh, lungs. And so if you think about it, when a vessel collides with the carapace, it could almost instantaneously have an effect on the lungs or even the spinal cord, which sits right below the carapace as well. Um, so with the vessel strikes, they can be caused by a range of different vessels. So it could even be a kayak to a jet ski, to a small boat or boat, um, motor boat, to a yacht, to a ferry or a barge. So really the whole wide range of sizes of vessels can have an impact on these animals. And there's two types of trauma we find with vessel strikes. And this is now going to sound a little bit like CSI, but we have sharp force trauma and blunt force trauma. Sharp force trauma is what you see here in this photo. So usually it's uh, defined by parallel lines in the carapace, um, typically caused by the propeller of the boat. And then blunt force trauma looks more like the crushing of the shell. And that's usually caused by the hull or the skeg of the boat. Um, so that is something we look at when we are examining our sea turtles that have vessel strikes and unfortunately, it's not too common that they're able to come back from a vessel strike, especially in a severity like this one, 
We have had some rehab cases uh, with our partners over at Sea Turtle Recovery in New Jersey. They were able to rehab a female loggerhead sea turtle who had a vessel strike to the rear end of her carapace. And uh, thankfully, they were able to successfully rehab her. We attached a satellite tag and she's been moving throughout the water um, as a normal sea turtle should, which is very exciting. So one of the last threats we're going to talk about is hypothermia or what we would call cold stunning. So sea turtles as reptiles utilize their environment to help regulate their body temperature. So once our water temperatures drop below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, which usually happens during our first um, cold snap of the year, so typically late fall, early winter, these sea turtles haven't made their way down south yet. And so when the water temperature drops, they become what we call cold stunned or essentially paralyzed. So they're found floating at the surface, they're not swimming, they're not really eating, they're kind of just resting there and just trying to breathe and keep their organ systems functioning as normally as possible. And then when we get a strong wind, it pushes them up onto the North shore of Long Island, if the sea turtles are within the Long Island Sound. And when that happens and these turtles are out of the water, really time is of the essence because these guys aren't used to being on land and having the weight of gravity on their body. And then they're also exposed to the elements. So they're exposed to wind, to rain, maybe even to snow. And so their condition can decline quite quickly. So we actually monitor the beaches during late fall, early winter. Typically we walk them uh, just after high tide and these sea turtles can be found in the high tide line or what we would call the rack line. Um, and sometimes they're kind of covered up, uh, but once we find them, we need to get them off the beach and into a rehab facility as quickly as possible so that they can get warmed up, probably get some fluids and antibiotics. Um, and then just within a couple months or so, hopefully if their condition has improved, they're able to be released typically down in Florida and the Georgia area, because we can't release them up here in New York until, you know, mid-summer when the water is finally warm enough for them. So if you're interested in joining us, you can become a beach monitor volunteer. So that's doing exactly what I just described, walking certain beaches during those months right after high tide. And if you were to find a uh, sea turtle on the beach, you would call the New York State Stranding Hotline and the biologist would work with you to either come get the turtle from you or they might even ask you to help transport the turtle um, to a rehab facility nearby. So now we're gonna talk about this map that I mentioned briefly earlier. So this is marine mammal and sea turtle strandings in the New York bite from 2017 through 2020. But tonight, since we're focusing on sea turtles, we're going to stay uh, looking at the green squares. So during this four year period, we had 349 sea turtles strand. If you look down here, you'll see quite a few green squares in what we call the New York bite. So we've got Staten Island, the Rockaways. And so we do find quite a few sea turtles here with evidence of vessel strikes. And that might be because this area is heavily populated with boats during the summertime. And we have the New York shipping channels right here as well. So these sea turtles, they can't necessarily see, hear, or feel vessels around them. So that's why we're finding that they might be um, having interactions um, with a variety of different types of vessels uh, throughout the summer months. So again, I just wanna reiterate, when you guys are out there on the water, definitely be careful, keep your eyes peeled for not just sea turtles, but dolphins and whales as well, because they are in our waters, especially during this time of year. And then if you look up here along the North shore, we have quite a large number of sea turtles washing up here. And that's gonna be because of cold stunning, as I mentioned earlier, when they get cold sun in the Long Island Sound and then that wind comes through, pushes them along the shore. So we're typically gonna see those numbers increase around late fall, early winter. So this has not yet been updated with our 2020 numbers, um, 
of animals with human interaction because we're still working through some of those reports. Um, so we can't just automatically determine that human interaction was the cause of death for an animal, even if it seems quite obvious, like an entanglement or marine debris ingestion. We actually send samples off to pathologists and they have to confirm um, our initial results, which says that uh, that human interaction was the cause of the animal's death. So, but just looking here for this three-year period from 2017 through 2019, there were 248 sea turtle strandings, 65 of which were um, deemed because of human interaction. So that's 26% of the sea turtles that were found to have passed away due to human action, interaction. And if you ask me, I think that's 26% too high. We shouldn't be having an impact on these animals and causing their lives to end. Ultimately, the marine environment is their home. And when we go there, we're visiting. So would you go to someone's house and leave your trash everywhere or kind of wrap things up in lines and ropes? Hopefully not. Um, so I encourage you guys when you are visiting, um, beaches or just parks or just enjoying the outdoor environment. Uh, we always want to leave it better than we found it for the animals that call that home. So if you joined us for a beach monitoring walk for cold stun sea turtles while you're out there, um, you could certainly collect marine debris while you're down there because unfortunately no beach across Long Island or I would bet anywhere in the world is immune to this problem of marine debris. So if you don't find a sea turtle, that's actually a good thing. And then you can work towards um, collecting marine debris. So I like to share this slide at the end of most of our presentations because I just think it gives a great kind of take home message. So I encourage you all to keep our beaches clean by taking your trash with you when you leave and maybe any other trash that you might find while you're down there. As I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, most of the animals that we respond to are federally protected. And those laws say that you need to stay at least 150 feet away from a marine mammal or sea turtle, whether that's in the water or on the beach. And that's not just for the animal safety, that's for your safety as well. These are wild animals, they can carry diseases. So you definitely wanna keep your distance, especially if you have your pets with you. And please report any marine mammal and sea turtle sightings to us at sightings at amcs.org. Carly will put that in the chat for you all. Um, so yes, we respond to stranded animals and animals that need help. But we also really enjoy seeing live, healthy animals out there in the water and living their lives uh, to the fullest. And so we would greatly appreciate any reports you guys might have if it's just one dolphin, one whale, maybe you saw a sea turtle, maybe you saw a pod of dolphins, that's definitely information that we would like to know. Also, please report any sick, injured, or deceased marine mammals and sea turtles to the New York State Stranding Hotline. We'll also put this number in the chat, and that number is 631-369-9829. And if you have your phone nearby or maybe a pen, a piece of paper, I encourage you go ahead and put that number in your phone or write it down and put it in your phone later because you truly never know when you'll need it. Um, it's not usually a marine biologist that's walking along the beach and finds a stranded marine mammal or sea turtle. It's a member of the general public. So if you go ahead and put this number in your phone now, then you are better prepared if you find yourself in that situation, and then you're able to get that animal the proper help um, and response um, to hopefully help that animal um, that is stranded. So with that, does anybody have any questions? And you can feel free to unmute yourself or put them in the chat. We have no comments so far, Lindsay. You did a great job. <laughs> Thank you, Carly. 
Well, I know I threw a lot of information at you all this evening. So if you come up with any questions or comments later, um, this is my email right here. Again, my name is Lindsay and you can email me at education at amcs.org. And I'd be happy to hear any of your comments or if you think of any other questions or concerns you might have, um, I'll try to answer those as well. Oh, we have a thank you. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and if you guys are interested in joining us for the sea turtle beach monitoring walk, so looking for cold stunned sea turtles, if you're interested in joining us for a beach cleanup or other opportunities to get out in the community while safely socially distancing, um, we would be happy to have you. Uh, we have lots of beach cleanups coming up at the end of this month and into September, which is International Coastal Cleanup Day month. Um, it's kind of celebrated throughout the whole month of September. Uh, so we'll have a lot going on with that. Um, so hopefully I can see you guys at other education programs or maybe events um, outside and in the community. And if you're interested in joining us, again, you're welcome to email me. And if you're more interested in our volunteer program, you can email us at volunteers at amcs.org. Thank you. Thank you. I wanna say thank you everybody for joining us this evening. Thank you to Catherine for hosting us. Um, you guys have been such a joy to present to this mm -hmm. evening and hopefully you learned something new um, and you can go and share the information with your friends and family. Thank you very much.